answer the question of the title, the secret to becoming better at coding is to join hackathons. But just joining them is not enough. If you do not have the correct mindset and the correct process, you will not gain as much from the hackathons. Joining hackathons forces you to go through the entire process of product development in a short period of time, including ideating, planning, and also coding. Joining more hackathons forces you to try out new ideas and connect with other people's ideas, making you a better programmer. I've joined around 10 hackathons so far, and out of the 10, I've managed to get top 3 positions in 8 of the hackathons. And out of the 8, I've actually gotten first place for 4 of them. So other than winning a lot of cash prize from my hackathon winnings, I've also gained a lot of friends and knowledge along the way. So today, I want to share with you a reflection on my latest hackathon, and on the way, share with you my process of winning these hackathons and gaining the most out of them. So this reflection is actually inspired by my mentor in school. He has often drilled into my head that there's actually two parts to any achievement. So just to give you a little background, I've recently clinched in first place for my team at the local Singaporean hackathon. The theme of this hackathon was using generative artificial intelligence. So students from all across Singapore high schools participated in this hackathon, and out of 400 students, there were 5 teams who will be awarded the top prize of 2,500 Singapore dollars. And our team was one of the winners. You can view my performance and the project demo here to get an idea of the hackathon. Singgen, we are a platform that creates infomercial and video generation platform. Nowadays, the customers struggle with information overload due to lengthy text insurance documents. And this creates a lot of missed business opportunity for SingLife. So, the first part of the achievement is obviously the achievement itself. In this case, it is the winning of my hackathon. But the second and most important part, which is also the part that is often overlooked, is the process and development of that achievement. Winning the hackathon is the easy part. So in this reflection, I want to talk to you about the process of how I won and give you actionable steps to be able to repeat this kind of winnings. I'll be talking about three main points today. Number one, what kind of obstacles we faced during the hackathon? Number two, what are the things that I should do and not should not do in the future? And number three, what are some principles or systems that I can come up with so that you will be able to duplicate my winnings in the future? So, number one, what kind of obstacles did I face? The hardest part of any hackathon is the idea generation part. Most often, a killer idea is good enough to win the hackathon. But because we computer science students have limited views, we often come up with generic ideas and do not dare to dream big. Luckily, our teammate this time had experience in artificial intelligence and also catches up with new ideas and new concepts in the AI space through watching YouTube videos. So through mere exposure to the tech YouTube space, we were able to gain inspiration from other people's ideas and mesh them together to come up with fresh ideas of our own. Number two, everybody was actually busy during the hackathon period and thus we were not able to focus our efforts fully. Two of my teammates were doing their full-time internships during their period while the other two, including me, had assignments. Additionally, we all had very different life setups and schedules. These two factors made it very challenging for us to find a time where all of us were able to work on the project together. We will often have to do our individual tasks asynchronously and then merge our projects together once we all have that short pocket of time together. So what are some things that we can do next time? We were fortunate enough to have a good leader who had a lot of experience with team management and project management. With him, he was able to curate actionable tasks and distribute it to us to work on asynchronously. I was inspired by him and I would like to take this principle one step further. As a leader next time myself, the most important thing is to actually decide on the idea as quickly as possible and then curate actionable items for your teammates. Your leadership style will heavily influence your team's morale and this will also influence how much effort they put in. If you're able to lead with confidence, no matter how bad your actual idea is, your teammates will then feel your confidence and thus make the idea better for you in the end. The second point is loosely connected to the previous point. This idea is regarding how to distribute tasks to your teammate without needing them to wait on the others to finish their tasks. Most of the time in programming projects, you often have a lot of parts that are dependent on each other. For example, let's say you're trying to build an e-commerce platform. There will be a list of task dependencies. In this case, to start work on the e-commerce platform, you might say, Oh, I first need to set up a database. Then I can create my backend API endpoints. Then I can create my frontend interface to actually consume these endpoints. To dig even deeper, let's say I have certain backend endpoints, you might say that, oh, I need to have these certain data models to be set up before I can create the CRUD operations on these data models. This creates a huge problem when working on a team. Your frontend engineers will be bottlenecked by the backend engineers. And the backend engineers will be bottlenecked within themselves trying to sort out who should kickstart the project first. A brilliant idea taught to me by one of my lecturers is called the Jigsaw Method. I came out with the name myself, but the summary of the idea is like this. Instead of listing out your project's tasks as nodes that are dependent on previous nodes completion, you lay out the entire structure of your applications with fake APIs. Then you can distribute this task list to ask people to simultaneously fulfill these fake APIs. With the fake APIs, your different nodes no longer need to rely on the previous nodes completion to finish the feature. 
So just like a jigsaw puzzle, everyone can work on their own separate parts. I can have four people working in four corners of the jigsaw puzzle separately. They do not need to wait for another person to finish their part in order to start their next part. So let me demonstrate this concept with an illustration so that you can better understand this methodology. So for example, I'm trying to build an e-commerce platform. I have my front end here. So this is my front end. So imagine I'm trying to work on the feature. So I have a search bar here and also and so right now, my backend will return me with a bunch of rectangles. So these are all listings from my e-commerce site. So with this front end, I also have a backend. So I also have this backend. And so basically this backend will have an endpoint that says slash get slash listings. So this right now, this backend API has been implemented. So my front end can just hit this backend API and get back all these listings. But right now, what if the project now needs the search bar functionality? So as a front end developer, I will I'll go ahead and ask the backend guy, hey, are you done implementing the endpoint for the, me to search? If the backend guy has not actually implemented the endpoint, I cannot do anything, right? Because if I don't have the endpoint to hit, I can't get back the results of the filter query. So what happens? So if my backend does not have this post, let's say I'm doing slash listings slash search, right? If my backend, if my backend engineer does not make the endpoint for me, as a front-end engineer, I'm bottlenecked by him. So what the jigsaw problem solve is that instead of needing the front end to depend on the back end for this actual API endpoint, why not I just make a fake endpoint for now? So I'm gonna make a fake post endpoint, right? However, however this is gonna be fake, meaning it's going to return, meaning it's gonna return just a an array of let's say ID or of, of let's say ID of one and name of ball, right? So this uh, back end endpoint will return me with this fake endpoint with this fake array and then with this fake array then my front end can go and actually take the fake data and then just do the whatever uh, filtering ui that it needs to do so you can see that the front end is no longer dependent on waiting for the backend engineer to actually complete the endpoint fully so we just need to have a fake skeleton data as long as it returns the correct type all my backend and my front end can be working on the same project at the same asynchronously without needing to depend on each other that's also why it's called the jigsaw. Uh, that's also why I call it the jigsaw principle. So just like a jigsaw puzzle, right? You can basically have all these, uh, all these pieces all together, right? But it doesn't matter. I don't have to wait for one corner to be done before working on my corner. Why? Because I have a bird's eye view of the entire project. So, right? so as a project manager, if I have a bird's eye view of the entire project, I know what kind of endpoints need to be set up, what kind of functionality needs to be set up. Then I can basically make all these fake endpoints that returns me with fake data. But the fact that there is some data returning and the endpoints exist allows all my developers to then work on separate projects and separate parts of the projects without needing to rely on each other. Without this fake endpoint, this whole jigsaw puzzle will become synchronous, meaning that without building this corner of this puzzle, I cannot build the other corners. Do you see? So do you see how limiting this factor can be if you do not use the jigsaw principle? So this is a really powerful principle in order for your whole team to work on the projects asynchronously and then at the end merge it together just by making fake endpoints and having the bird's eye view of the project. All right, so coming back, what should we not have done for this hackathon? For hackathons, you should probably schedule your timings to collaborate on the project. I understand that hackathons are usually side projects from your main timeline. And so you do not have the time to fully commit to a single hackathon for the entire period. You should however still hold designated weekly meetings to discuss the project and check in on each other's progress. This ties back to the project management strategies like Scrum. We do not follow structured meetings and often our meetings were actually messy, causing a lot of time to be wasted. Here's what we should have done next time. We should have meetings every few days. This of course depends on the timeline of your hackathon and the meeting should not take more than one hour. Each meeting should have a clear objective and a structure. You may take the structure from any project management strategies that you prefer. But here's one for example. Each person during the meeting will have to report back two things. Number one, the progress on the completion of their assigned tasks. And number two, the roadblocks along their tasks that they need help with. At the end of the meeting, the leader should collate everything and redistribute their new task to the team to work on. This task should of course follow the jigsaw task assignment principle as mentioned just now. So to end off as a conclusion, I'm gonna try to package out, up everything into a system for anyone who wants to increase their winnings in hackathons. Number one, find diverse teammates who have different strengths. For hackathons, you ideally want your teammate to be made out of 50% tech people and also 50% of the people who are good with business presentations and aesthetics. Having a good prototype coded up by your programmers are important. But if you do not have the capability to present it well to the judges and audience, it's useless. So, you need people who are good with presenting and have a good sense of aesthetics for the presentation. Number two, for idea generation, immerse yourself in tech news and hackathon ideas. 
You can find all of these on YouTube and also Tech Block. Keep on the lookout for good ideas you come across and note them down. When you're in need for ideas, you can refer to your pin notes for potential ideas that are relevant to your current hackathon. This is actually what led us to coming up with the idea for our winning hackathon this time. Number three, have a good leader who is proficient in project management or train yourself to be a dead leader. In the context of hackathons, to fully utilize the Jigsaw framework, you need a leader who is experienced with full-stack development. This allows the leader to have a bird's eye view of the project and know exactly what are the steps in order to achieve the idea. You need to know all the intermediate steps in order to properly distribute the tasks and allow your teammates to work asynchronously without needing to be dependent on each other to continue on with their work. Number four. Lastly, you want to pinpoint the judging rubrics of the hackathon. Some hackathons focus more on the uniqueness of the idea, while others care more about the execution and lastly, some others care about the business potential of the ideas. You need to know what the judges are looking for, and then focus your efforts in achieving those points. For example, some hackathons are called ideatons. Why? Because they focus more on the innovation and do not care much about the execution and the tech stack you use. For such ideatons, try to think out of the box and do not limit your imagination. Usually, the crazier the idea, the more you will win these ideatons. But if you're joining hackathons who focus more on the execution and tech stack, then you should play it safe and not come up with a crazy idea that's not feasible to be built out. So I hope this reflection and these tips that I have given you through my experience joining hackathons has helped you in the process. I hope that you can use these tips to go out and win more hackathons and become a better software developer. So if you found this video helpful, liking, subscribing and commenting on this channel will actually help me a lot. It can also help me improve on the channel. Other than that, thank you so much for watching and have a good day.